A History of the Yoruba People. S. Adabanji Akindi. The Primacy of Ife, 11th to 15th Century. The History of the Ife Kingdom from Oduduwa, about 1000 AD, to about 1900 AD, falls roughly into three broad periods the period from about 1000 to about 1500, the period from about 1500 to about 1800, and the period covered by the 19th century. The period from Oduduwa to the 15th century was a period of growing economic and political prosperity and power in the history of Ife. Not only did the kingdom grow and prosper at home, it also became the source of inspiration for major political changes in Yoruba land in general. In the course of the four centuries before the 15th century, kingdoms like that of Ife sprang up in most parts of the Yoruba forests, all of them acknowledging Ife's leadership, their rulers claiming Ife as the source of their origin and legitimacy. From the 15th century, a decline set in as powerful rivals, Benin and Oyoila, emerged. By the end of this period in the 18th century, Ife was a small weak kingdom in the heart of Yoruba land, even though all other Yoruba kingdoms continued to regard it with awe. In the third period, from 1800 to 1900, Ife plunged into disaster. Its territory violated and subjugated, its city in ruins, the Ife kingdom shrank to a faint shadow of its former self even though flickers of its old image were never totally extinguished in the cultural and spiritual sensitivities of most Yoruba people. Only the first period, the period of expansion and glory, belongs to this chapter. After Odujua's departure from the scene, his aura continued to glow over everything and everybody. His subjects had, of course, seen kings before indeed some of them had been kings themselves, many were descendants of kings, and most adults had lived in the small pre oduduwa kingdoms. But nobody had ever seen a king with the sort of stature and glory that Oduduwa had had as king of Ila Ife. Not only did the chiefs and priests take steps to deify him, the collective imagination of the masses began to represent him as larger than life. Long before then there had existed, no doubt, the myth about Halatomir sending some heavenly beings to come and establish life on the earth. That basic story would no longer do. Oduduwa had to be part of it indeed, he had to be the leader of the heavenly beings that came to the earth. Over the next centuries, the myth-making genius of the Yoruba nation amplified and embellished Odujua's part in the story of creation. The titanic fight between him and Obatala had to be woven into it. So, in the end, the full detail of the story came to be that Obatala had first led the heavenly beings coming towards the earth, but that he had got drunk on the way and Odujua had taken over and completed the mission, thus becoming the first man on the earth and the progenitor of the Yoruba nation. Ife palace traditions have preserved an enormous body of information about the kings who reigned in Ila Ife after Odudua, and therefore about the growth of the kingdom. Details of these traditions are sometimes difficult to understand and unravel, and sometimes seem to contradict one another. Nevertheless, historians have illuminated a path through it all that most can agree upon. Odudua's kingdom started as just the city of Ila Ife with, of course, the open farmlands around it farmlands that the pre oduduwa settlements had gradually claimed from the forests over many centuries. One of the immediate consequences of the rise of a single substantial polity in the place of the many small ones was the emergence of a fairly strong state that was disposed, and able, to claim and use territory at considerable distances from its own immediate location. Oduduwa started the trend. As earlier pointed out, he established toll gates and guard posts to protect the trade routes into and out of Ila Ife. Some such outposts were at greater distances out into the forests than any of the pre oduduwa settlements could have ventured at Ipatumadu, Ida Ijero, and Apamu, to mention the few definitively identified in the traditions. A kingdom was thus emerging which consisted not only of the city housing the king but also of other towns, villages and hamlets far beyond. Oduduwa thus initiated the structure of the typical Yoruba kingdom of the future. For reasons not known to us, the Ife kingdom did not, eventually, go out for as much territory as it could easily have done, but remained comparatively small territorially until other kingdoms arose and limited the possibility of further expansion especially Ilesa to the east, Ou to the west and, ultimately largest and strongest of them all, Oyoila to the north. The forests southwards to the Oni River, part of the deepest forests in Yoruba land, were regarded as part of the Ife kingdom, and received some small Ife settlements at various times in Ife's history. Territorially then, the Ife kingdom did not become as large as it could have. But that did not constitute any limit to the importance of this kingdom. For about five centuries, Ife was the most revered of all the kingdoms of the Yoruba people. Its territory was sacred and inviolate to all Yoruba people, by a universal consensus. It is possible, from examining Yoruba traditions concerning the Ife kingdom after Oduduwa, 
to come to the conclusion that its ascendancy over Yoruba land for centuries was simply religious and spiritual. The typical Yoruba mode of speaking about ancient Ife tends to encourage such a conclusion, but such a conclusion would be only partly true. It is true that, though the general direction of Yoruba religion had evolved slowly over millennia in the Yoruba forests, it was at Ila Ife after Odudua that most of the deities and leading spirits dominant in Yoruba religion were given final form and personality and then given to the rest of Yoruba land. The list is long, but suffice it to mention only a few here. A patron god of working people and of iron existed in all Yoruba land long before Odudua, probably, as earlier suggested, with the name Alaka Ie, but it was the kingdom of Ife that finally gave him the name Ogun, the name of an Ife king, and made his cult a royal cult. Deities of wealth and of the sea certainly had existed, but it was in the Ife kingdom that they were combined as one and given the name Olokun, from the name of a rich woman contemporary of Odudua. Even the most senior Yoruba god, Orzenla, became Obatala, the name of Odudua's eminent contemporary, and was, thereafter, so known to all of Yoruba land. The ancient deity probably originally known as Elephon, and still so called in some eastern Yoruba kingdoms, had his name changed to Obalufon, the name of an Ife king. The ancient god of divination, Ifa, also came to bear the name Orunmla, the name of perhaps the greatest Ifa priest in about the time of Odudua. Of the other Yoruba kingdoms, only the kingdom of Oyoila shared a little of such religious honor. The ancient god of lightning and thunder, very probably originally known as Jakuta, had his name changed to Sango, the name of an Oyoila king. But even Sango was usually thought of as originating ultimately from Ife. For all Yoruba people after Odudua, Therefore, Ife was the home of the progenitor of the Yoruba race and the home of virtually all pan-Yoruba gods a place to honor and fear, a place to pay homage to in almost all religious observances. The Ife kingdom was also the home of the most famous persons in Yoruba land for nearly five centuries, and the source of the greatest movements in the spiritual and cultural life of Yoruba people. After Odudua himself and his many famous contemporaries, the growing civilization of the city of Ila Ife continued to produce great men and women founders of kingdoms, great traders, farmers, priests, artists and artisans, Babalawo, priests of the god of divination, Anasgun, herbalists, Adahans, men of occult power, men and women lofty enough to be deified or to be counted among the gods and goddesses. The career of Orunmala was one of the most luminous of these great lives. Orunmala grew up in Ila Ife as a great Babalawo, a priest of Ifa. Then, According to many traditions, he embarked upon a career of lifelong travel all over Yoruba land, practicing and teaching the very best in Ifa divination and mysteries, as well as spiritual development. In the process, he lived for a few years each in many places in Yoruba land, leaving his strong mark on religious and cultural life. According to some Aju Ifa verses, his longest stay was in Adu, in Ekiti, and this has led to suggestions that he was probably of Ekiti extraction. At last, in great old age, Orunmala returned to live his last days in Ila Ife. Some traditions claim that he was then crowned king of the Ife kingdom, but the preponderance of traditions negates that claim. But it is well known that he did wear a crown in his last days, a sort of sacred crown in honor of the god of divination. After his death, he was deified and his name became a second name for Ifa in all parts of Yoruba land. Stories about Orunmala constitute a significant body of stories in Yoruba folklore. Arun Mila's career was typical of men and women in a growing movement based in Ila Ife, dedicated to the search for and dissemination of knowledge and enlightenment. The growth of such a movement was one of the great gifts of the city of Ila Ife to Yoruba civilization and it was one of the foundations of Ife's image as the place from which the sun rises, that is, the source of light or enlightenment. Many groups sprang up in the era of Ife's economic, political and cultural primacy, each seeking to advance its own brand of knowledge, knowledge of herbs, of the past or history or mythology, of the invisible forces at work in the world, of divination, of the making of magically effectual articles, or charms, of the hidden secret meanings and power of words, called Ofo or Ojid, of hidden, occult, names for ordinary objects, of out-off-body projections, of access to the power of witchcraft for wisdom and other beneficial purposes all of which Chief Isola Fabiami, the Odolatuno base of Ife, has described as the esoteric sciences. Some centers other than Ife became pan-Yoruba centers for some of these esoteric sciences like iron and Akoko and Ada in Awari for access to witchcraft, and iron Ekiti for acquisition of special bonds with, and power from, the god Ogun. However, Ife was the home of the greatest concentration of cultic knowledge and power. Traveling in order to know more and to teach was a common preoccupation of the cultic groups. As the Ila Ife type of kingdom supplanted the old settlements in various parts of Yoruba land, 
members of these groups were able to travel more easily and to reside abroad in the new kingdoms. Ila Ife became the place to which the wise came from all over Yoruba land and beyond to acquire some special knowledge and to add to the stock of special knowledge as members or initiates or adepts of the Ife groups and cults. It was no doubt in these centuries, and in this cultural atmosphere, that the Ajuifa developed into the enormous complex of knowledge, myths and wisdom that has come down to us. What all this seems to add up to is that a cultural ferment, with a strong intellectual character, was in progress in Ila Ife in the centuries following the creation of the city, a cultural ferment whose light gradually spread to the rest of Yoruba land. The spreading light also had revolutionary political ramifications, an account of which will form the subject of another chapter. The foundation for all this cultural ferment, however, was the growing economic prosperity and power of the city of Ila Ife and the kingdom of Ife. For nearly 500 years, from Odujua's time, to the 14th century, the Ife kingdom was the richest and economically most powerful state in Yoruba land. Its preeminence in Yoruba land, in those centuries, was not merely spiritual and cultural, it was also economic. The economically expanding society of Ila Ife multiplied opportunities for self-improvement as well as freedom to venture into cultural expressions and thought. That is why and how Ife became the heart of Yoruba land and nearly everything of cultural importance. The economic foundations laid in the city of Ila Ife in Adujua's time produced increasing wealth in the centuries that followed. Trade grew. The emergence of other centers of urban population in other parts of Yoruba land, of which an account will be given later, most definitely improved the channels of trade. This meant that more and more trade flowed into and out of Ila Ife. After some time, some of the newly arisen kingdoms became important secondary centers of trade. Of these, perhaps the earliest were Oyo Ila in the north. Ijebuod in the southwest, Ilesa in the east, Owo in the southeast and some of the Akiti kingdoms. Meanwhile, the coastal east-west lagoon trade was producing a significant center of trade in the far southeast, namely Benin. More will be said in a subsequent chapter about the growth of trade and trade routes in Yoruba land in this period of many kings and cities. Suffice it to say that until about 1400 Ife remained the hub of trade routes pointing in all directions in Yoruba land. Most goods from the savannah, the Sahara and the Mediterranean world found their way to Ila Ife for onward distribution to the rest of Yoruba land and the Edo country, and goods from these territories to the north first went to Ila Ife. The result was that Ila Ife grew for upwards of four centuries as a great trading center. Industrial production grew in response to the growing trade in Ila Ife in those centuries. In general, too, agricultural production grew, though the traditions tell of some interruptions by drought and famine and widespread Yoruba traditions tell of large growths in Ife's population in these centuries, and how the population growths engendered migrations from the Ife area to other parts of Yoruba land. Continuing a trend initiated in Adujua's time, certain aspects of Ife's industrial production became special buttresses of the political system and, therefore, matters for close royal regulation. The most important of these was the bead industry. In the first place, increasingly from Adujua's time, Beads became the distinctive material component of royal grandeur beads in the making of crowns, insignia, scepters, ceremonial royal fans and horsetail fly whisks, beads on the royal person as necklaces, bracelets and anklets, beads woven into the royal regalia and into the braided hair of royal females. Secondly, and conceivably more importantly, as the new kingdoms emerged across the face of Yoruba land, beads became the most important material objects for establishing relationships between the Ife throne and the emerging royal dynasties. According to Akin Ogandiran, these preciosities and symbols were crucial in the development of Ila Ife as the primate center that many harbingers of dynastic institutions in the region visited and allied with to establish and validate their political power and ideology. This one factor, almost certainly more than any other, guaranteed the status of Ila Ife as the ever-beating heart of elite politics among Yoruba people for centuries. Would-be founders of new kingdoms, rulers of existing kingdoms, newly installed kings, all must procure, or obtain as ritualized gifts, the precious material symbols that only Ife could supply. Not surprisingly, therefore, the Ila Ife palace took the beat industry, as well as the making and distribution of its status products, increasingly under control. Apparently the average trader could always take or send beads to distant places in West Africa beyond Yoruba land. But inside Yoruba land, a significant part of bead distribution passed through channels dignified with palace rituals and royal glitter. The well-connected trader who was allowed into this sanctum could make for himself something more valuable than money, he could acquire status and influence. The artisan who lived by producing beaded crowns, insignia and other status products worked in dignified seclusion as a protege of the Ife palace. 
kings and palaces all over Yoruba land paid with fortunes for the objects essential to the exhibition of their legitimacy and grandeur before their subjects' beads, beaded crowns, beaded insignia and others. Below the level of kings, every chief of any rank bought some beads for status identity. Among ordinary citizens, the rich bought beads, usually as family treasure or for gifts to kings or chiefs, and most of the rest bought some beads for ritual and ceremonial family occasions. The industrial processes involved in the production of beads were ultimately concentrated mostly in one area of Ila Ife, about half a square mile in the northern outskirts, the area now known as Olokun Grove. Many materials for bead production processes have been found there including remains of furnaces in two years, bead polishing stones, ceramic crucibles for handling molten glass, with glass beads still fused with them. Various samples of glass beads and stone beads have also been found. Some other related manufacturing processes seem to have moved in with the bead processes. These included workshops for producing pottery and other ceramic ware, as well as others for the production of copper and brass sculptures. Like the bead industry, sculptural art in brass or bronze became an important symbol of the Ife dynastic system. Several pieces of these naturalistic sculptures have been found in the ancient city, mostly in locations in and around the palace and in sacred shrines, and have been dated to the period from the 11th century to the 15th. When these sculptures, especially the ones depicting naturalistic human heads and figures, were first unearthed in the early 20th century, scholars wondered, among other things, what their purpose might have been, but it is now more or less generally agreed that they were produced for very important rituals in the funerals of the kings of Ife. Most probably, each was carried in procession as a crowned naturalistic head of the dead Uni, mounted on an effigy, in a second funeral ceremony or Ako, the practice of second burial earlier briefly described in Chapter 2. Available evidence indicates that the use of the brass-slash-bronze sculptures in this way was an exclusive royal status symbol in Ife. After the effigy with its naturalistic brass-slash-bronze head had been put on show, the head was buried at a shrine, to be unearthed, and reburied, whenever certain rituals connected with the late king needed to be performed. Like all status ritualistic objects connected with the monarch, the brass sculptures were produced in secluded workshops and facilities. Each was produced during the lifetime of the uni whose head was being represented in brass or bronze, and it was most probably meant to be an exact portrait of him accomplished through the lost wax method of metal casting. The lost wax technique involved first making a model of the king's head with a soft material like solid wax. A thick layer of soft clay was poured all over this wax carving and left to dry. When the clay had dried, heat was applied to melt the wax, which drained away through holes provided in the clay. The molten brass or bronze was then poured in to replace the wax, and when it had cooled and solidified, the clay covering was broken off. Since each brass-slash-bronze sculpture was meant to be an exact representation of the king's head, these sculptures were almost certainly produced in much greater seclusion than were beaded crowns and insignia. Unlike beads and crowns and insignia, also, they were definitely not produced for export but exclusively for the Ife Palace. The production of these sculptures went on for about five centuries and then came to a more or less abrupt end in the 15th century. For five centuries, the sculptures had been a very important component of the symbolism of the Eunice Royal Majesty. What seems to have happened is that, as the economic foundations of Ife's greatness eroded during the 15th century, much of the political greatness came to be lost, and economic and political realities brought some symbols of the Eunice power and pageantry, such as the naturalistic brass representations of royalty, to an end. The above naturalistic sculptures in brass or bronze for royal purposes were only part of a very rich and vibrant artistic culture in the Kingdom of Ife, and in Yoruba land in general, in the centuries beginning with Odujua's time. The quality of wood sculptures improved continually. Brass and bronze were also used in the making of accessories like bangles for ankles, idese, wrists, idowo, and necks, igborun, and for various ritual or decorative objects like stools, staffs, bells, vessels, and ceremonial or official rods. Silver also came into use in accessories like bangles and rings, as well as in some decorative items for lineage compounds and palaces. The old art in iron grew, the blacksmiths generally becoming more skilled in fabricating ceremonial and ritual staffs, usually with stylized representations of birds, for the use of priests and devotees of various orisa and cults. The emergence of the many Yoruba kingdoms, cities and towns greatly facilitated the spread and growth of art in Yoruba society in these centuries which, as would be remembered, Drool, Pemberton and Abyodun divided into the following four eras, Early Pavement Era, Late Pavement Era, Post Pavement Era, and Stylized Humanism Era. In addition to many impressive sculptural products in wood, clay, brass-slash-bronze, and iron, 
This period in Ife and Yoruba history also produced many important stone products and stone carvings and stele for shrines, and in human figures, many of which are naturalistic. Of all the stone works done in Ife, the most famous is the sculpture known as Opa Ornmian, Staff of Ornmian, which is located in a small shrine in the heart of Ila Ife. Opa Ornmian is a shaft made of granite, standing over 18 feet high, with an estimated one foot buried in the ground, and having iron nails studded in a curious pattern along its whole height. This stone sculpture was most probably produced to commemorate some important event in Ife's history, while its pattern of nail studs must also have had some symbolic meaning, unfortunately, both meanings are unknown to us today. The brass and terracotta sculptures of Ife represent the best of naturalistic art in the history of tropical Africa. They would, suggests one scholar, stand comparison with anything which ancient Egypt, classical Greece and Rome, or Renaissance Europe, had to offer. The first European to see them, Leo Fra Benius during a visit to Ila Ife in 1910, wrote that they were eloquent of a symmetry, a vitality, a delicacy of form directly reminiscent of ancient Greece. Because these sculptures, as naturalistic art, stand far above and beyond any other found in tropical Africa, there has been much debate concerning them. Fra Benius expressed the opinion that, since no indigenous African civilization could have produced this level of naturalistic art, it must be that a race far superior to the Negro had settled here. Such opinions persisted for decades, for quite understandable reasons. First, it seemed as if the tradition of brass or bronze casting was unknown in the modern city of Ila Ife. Secondly, it seemed that similar art traditions did not exist in the region to which Ila Ife belongs, including all the rest of Yoruba land. In short, then, the naturalistic sculptural art of ancient Ila Ife seemed like an isolated occurrence in the history of the region, an isolation that thus raised legitimate doubts about its indigenous origins. However, in the course of the 20th century, most of the supposed isolation disappeared. Some survivals of the brass-slash-bronze sculptural tradition have been discovered in modern Ila Ife, and evidence has come to light that the art tradition existed in many other places in Yoruba land, for instance in Owo, and in Oboagunla northern Akiti, in Ijebu Ode, etc. by the late 20th century, therefore, there was no serious doubt left that the Yoruba people were in fact the creators of this naturalistic art tradition that ranks easily with the best in the history of the world. Kings and Reigns It is against the general background described above, then, that the reigns of Ife kings from the 11th century to the 15th century must be viewed. By and large, it was a long period of economic growth and political stability, punctuated by comparatively minor political troubles and short periods of drought and famine. Historical interpretations that see apparent intrusions into the royal line as proof of violent political disturbances most probably exaggerate. One problem beset the successions to the Ife throne from the beginning, the system left fluid the choice of successor from among members of the royal family. The neighboring Yungaretto kingdom of Benin, beyond the southeastern borders of Yorubland, settled, when it emerged, for the principle of primogeniture, succession by only the first son of the king. Ife had earlier chosen to give the highest chiefs the power to choose the new uni from among princes of the royal family, including sons and grandsons of former kings. Such a system became the abiding Ife system and later the typical Yoruba system. It had the potential for political troubles, but it had the virtue of empowering the subjects to choose their king. Yoruba people, in fact, came to fall in love with, and become proud of, this system because it emphasized the political rights of the people as against the possibility of excesses in the prescriptive claims of royalty. Indeed, as will be seen later, the Yoruba monarchical system as it developed from Ife was a system of limited monarchy. In its initial operations in Ife, the system of succession proved repeatedly problematic, but none of the problems seems to have ever developed into a full-blown catastrophic disruption. Furthermore, one point that was made in the previous chapter needs to be re-emphasized here. As much as possible, Odudiwa had included the pre-existing leadership groups into the new leadership of Ile Ife. After him, the chiefs and the people in general expected their kings to follow his example. As king followed upon king over a long time, this expectation became less and less troublesome, but in the reigns of the first few kings, it was a very serious factor in the way people assessed their kings. In the first few reigns, therefore, some kings who did not do well in this matter provoked reactions that led to political troubles. Finally, from looking at the names of the kings as well as some versions of the traditions, some historians have come to the conclusion that the Priyodidua ruling families must have somehow made their way to the throne of Ila Ife at certain times in the years after Odudua. Such an occurrence is not necessarily improbable. However, since we do not have definitive information to this effect, we need to look also at other possibilities. 
for instance, intermarriages among the leading families must have been common. Intermarriages would produce situations in which the Priyodidua ruling families would have members born into the royal family. In the contest for the selection of king, an influential family would normally support the princely candidate close to itself by blood and the victory of such a candidate could be couched in the traditions as the victory of the influential family that pushed his candidature. Also, intermarriages could have resulted in the interposition of typical family names so that some royal princes could bear names drawn from their maternal ancestry. We do not know for sure whether either of these things happened at any point, but the possibility of either needs to be borne in mind. Odudua was succeeded by a man identified in the traditions as his son. However, the picture at this point is not too clear. Whoever succeeded him was, of course, officially his son, but the traditions are so complicated that this successor may have been his biological son or grandson, a close relative of his, one of his most loyal followers, or even one of his closest adherents from among the leading families of the pre Odudua settlements. Some traditions name this successor as Ogun but the name by which he has come down most clearly is Obalufon Ogbogbodenrin, probably Obalufon, follower, or maker, of the straight path, Obalufon Ogbogbodenrin is said to have been a very impressive personality. His subjects said of him that he shone like a large sun in the sky, hence, his other cognomen Osangong and Obamokan, roughly, the great sunlight that illuminates the earth at the height of day. All traditions agreed that his reign was long, and that it was peaceful most of the way. Towards the end of his life, he seems to have done something, or some things, that caused trouble with some sections of the kingdom's leadership. Whatever the problem was, it spilled into the reign of his son and successor, Obalufon Alamor. By then, the dissidents had grown so strong that the king himself died fighting them. Alamor's son or younger brother, Obalufon and Jijamagun, who was crowned after him, plunged straight into the same trouble. At this point, there appeared on the scene one of the greatest, one of the most enigmatic, characters in the early history of the Ife kingdom, Ornmian. One of the youngest grandsons of Oduduwa, Ornmian was probably the foremost warrior prince and adventurer that the Ife kingdom ever produced. According to many traditions, after prolonged adventures that took him to Benin in the southeast and to the Niger Valley in the northwest, he returned to Ila Ife, welcomed back by all as a Kinlagan, hero in battle. Finding the king, Obalufona Jijimagun, confronted by strong opponents led by a personage named Orzateko. He intervened, crushed Orizateko and his followers, drove a Jijimagun into exile, and accepted the throne. His intervention brought the troubles to a complete end. His reign was peaceful and long, lasting seventy years according to some traditions. He is remembered particularly for the attention he devoted to the development of the palace building. Under Odujua's immediate successor, Obalufonogbogboden Rin, the construction of a grand palace had gone a long way. Orinmian took the work in hand and, especially, remodeled what had already been built, changing the main entrance, the Heru, to where it has remained till today. After Orinmian, the Ife chiefs and people brought Obalufon and Jijamagan back to the throne or installed his son of the same name. This king then settled into a peaceful and very long reign. The traditions say that he reigned for 240 years, Ojilugba Odun, but this is certainly hyperbole to emphasize the great peace which the Ife kingdom enjoyed during his long reign. In the palace traditions, there is preserved a saying that a Jijimagun reigned long and peacefully because he took great care to observe certain rules or laws or conventions, Isasun. What these Isasun were is not explicitly spelled out in the traditions. However, it seems very probable that they comprise the agreements made to end the pre Odudua wars, the principle of inclusiveness in the government, all of which Odudua had faithfully observed. This would therefore give us a clue as to the cause of all the troubles that had faced the kings before Ornmian. Towards the end of his long reign, Obalufonog Bogbodenrin had probably flouted these rules and traditions and thus provoked organized resistance. His successors, Obalufon Alamor and Ajijimagun, had foolishly tried to fight rather than compromise until Ornmian had suppressed both sides in the strife. Ornmian as king had then gone back to a careful observance of the tradition of inclusion and, when Ajijimagun returned, or his son was enthroned, he promised to do the same and fulfilled his promise, and so had a long and peaceful reign. It is significant that when the opponents of Obalufon Alamor had eliminated him decisively with military might, they did not install their leader, or Zateko, on the throne, but allowed the installation of Alamor's son or brother. This could only mean that they were not fighting for the throne, they were fighting for certain principles of great importance, namely the Isasun, the principles of conscientious, dignified, inclusion. Obalufon and Jijimogun's observance of the rules was immortalized not only in sayings in the traditions. After his death, 
it was apparently laid down that he should be remembered in future installations of Uni, and that every new Uni should be reminded of what he had done to be such a good king. The ritual was therefore established whereby, when all other rituals of installation had been completed and the new king was to be crowned, the crown was first put on Ajijimo Gun's effigy and then taken off and placed on the new Unis head a ritual which has continued till our times. The peace that was thus established seems to have lasted for quite some time. Not until the time of Awurabayakan, some reigns later, do we hear of disturbances again. The palace traditions have it that Awurabayakan was assailed and assassinated during the processions of an Ogun festival. Various explanations have been given for this in the traditions. There are faint suggestions that Awurabayakan was only distantly related to the royal line and that he had employed some shady means to get the crown. But he also seems to have created trouble by seizing a well-connected man and sacrificing him at a ritual, thereby offending the victim's lineage. A general picture of political difficulties around this time is indicated by many traditions. Conditions are said to have got so bad during an interregnum that even a Yegbata, official leader of the king's messengers, a man named Lahua, had the audacity to have his friends declare him uni. And he probably held the throne for some time before he was assassinated. The tradition, made popular by Samuel Johnson in his The History of the Yorubas, of a radical change of the royal line from Odujua's descendants to some older Ife family, probably derives from the traditions relating to this period. Also, the Imol secret cult might have attained to its highest level of influence at this time, and to have had some impact on some selections of Uni. Some traditions indicate that a woman Uni reigned during this time. The political picture of this period is so cloudy, however, that a clear statement of its happenings and developments is extremely difficult. On the whole, what we seem to have here is a period characterized by frequent and tortuous succession disputes. The chosen system of selection of a king was still in its infancy, and it was prone to pitfalls, interferences and dissonance. Stories of seizures of power and change in the line of succession fit temptingly easily into the picture, but none of them are easy to authenticate. In the final analysis, the clearest feature in the picture is that the kingdom of Ife, in these its apparently stormy early years, continued to move forward as one kingdom, continued to grow in economic and cultural prosperity at home, and continued to rise in luminance, adoration and influence in the rest of Yoruba land. The succession twists and turns came to an end in the reign of Lohamizan, the eighth or ninth uni in the list of Ife kings reconstructed by various scholars from the traditions. It would seem that this man's family was a distant branch of the royal line, and that it was his father, Iotis, who had brought the family into the main line by winning the throne and ruling briefly as Uni, just before his son. According to the traditions, Lajimazan was a very rich prince, a large-scale yam farmer who became enormously rich because raw materials for making beads were discovered on his farm. He might also have had a bead-making business. He is said to have been so rich as a prince that he was regarded as second only to the Uni in wealth in Ila Ife. The traditions list another Uni immediately after Lajimazan. An uni whose name is not given and who is remembered only by his cognomen, Osgondaraku, i.e. he who turns a virgin forest into open ground. This cognomen was, according to Adiagbo Akinjogban, most probably Lajimazan's, coined in the light of his extensive farms and bead quarry operations. Lajimazan is important in the history of the Ife kingdom because, after him, the succession stabilized in his bloodline so that all uni after him have come from it. The next three or four centuries produced a long list of uni. Of these, some reigned for very long, many had only short reigns. Only the most significant happenings in these reigns will be mentioned here. Various uni added to the walls of the city, obviously to enclose new quarters springing up beyond existing walls. During most of this first long period of Ife's history from Odudua to the 15th century, the building of city walls does not seem to have been necessitated by any external dangers. After the Igbo Igbo raids were silenced, Ife seems to have been free for centuries from external threats. The kings continued, in spite of that, to build the walls. City walls became part of the cultural definition of a city in Ife. The king owed it to his subjects to enclose, and include, all of them with walls. Kings also sought to immortalize their names by building walls, by adding to the grandeur of the palace, and by expanding the king's marketplace. The Ife palace grew bigger and bigger over the centuries, and grand new additions usually ended up replacing the older structures, resulting in a palace that kept spreading out. The main gate in front of the palace, in particular, became more and more imposing as the kings added tall structures and high gables. On and around the palace grounds, many of the city's main shrines were located in arrangement which ensured that the palace was both the political and religious center of the city. Seasonal and annual rituals and festivals, as well as occasional royal audiences, brought the masses of the people to the palace courtyards from time to time to view and adulate their king. 
In the context of such celebrations, the Ariki, or praise poetry, of royal glory grew apace, poetry to shout an adoration at the king whenever he graciously showed his person. The high-domed, or conical, beaded crown evolved, with dangling frills to veil the king's face. A code of behavior appropriate in or near the palace developed, the flouting of which could lead to serious penalties. Meanwhile, the system of government of the Ife kingdom evolved slowly but surely. About the ultimate form of that government, more will be said in another chapter. In the kingdom of Ife, the final outlines of the monarchical government of the Yoruba people were developed in the first few centuries after Oduduwa. In the centuries of Ife's great wealth and influence, it does not seem to have had any significant military establishment. The traditions provide no account of external wars or military action, the impression one gets is that, after the suppression of the Igbo Igbo raids, Ife did not have to defend its interests with any major force. Small royal establishments held the toll posts on the main trade routes to provide security and collect the king's toll. Beyond that, no military establishment seems to have been needed or created. The Ife kingdom gradually became the exalted leader of the world around, not by the use of arms, but by the influence of its commerce and the expansion of its enormous cultural heritage. As the other Yoruba kingdoms emerged, each of them acknowledged Ife as head, and looked up to Ife as source of life and light rather than as a rival. That was destined to change, of course, but that change did not come for many centuries. Until about the end of the 14th century at least, there was what we must call an Ife empire an empire held together not by the force of arms but by the power of commerce, the belief in a common ancestry, and the manifest oneness of cultural heritage. Idiogbo Akinjogbin calls the linkages of Ife's ascendancy and Ebi system an acknowledgement by all rulers of Yoruba land that they belonged to one large family the ancestral source of which was Ife. In that kind of system, the important thing was not the actual source of the rulers of any particular kingdom, but the belief in the common ancestry. That system of belief held for centuries and, even after the decline and fall of Ife, continued to hold. 